love the way they were dressed like water in the blue and flowed down the waters of our sanctuary this morning. Was that on purpose? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful job. Thank you so much. Welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church in the beautiful Fountain City community of Knoxville, Tennessee on this 11th Sunday in the season after Pentecost. Today we are continuing our series on prayer. This is our third week and um, we're going to be talking about ways to pray. And uh, today this sermon is going to be interactive. So if you did not pick up some Play-Doh and some beads when you entered the sanctuary, sneak on back there and get some of those items to have in hand um, before we get started if you would like to participate. We would like to ask you not to get Play-Doh on the seat cushions the carpet. So be careful with your Play-Doh, but I hope that, I hope that everybody finds um, this time to be meaningful and informative as, as we think about different ways that we can pray. A uh, reminder that uh, this Friday we have our sold out um, concert, the annual Beatles birthday bash, starting at 7 o'clock. We've got a great treat lineup. Excited about all the baked goods, the music. What have we got? Oh, we can't remember all the names of that thing. Toffee balls. Some kind of jammy cakes. 
Battenberg cake, Eton mess. Brownies. With Eaton, Eaton mess. That's how you say it. Eaton Brownies mess. British, British things. British. <laughs> we have a great time here. It is sold out, so I hope you all have tickets. And Bee Gees is getting close to being sold out. So if you don't have your tickets for September 9th, you need to get those right away. Um, got a lot going on around here. We're glad that you're here to um, worship with us today, and we hope that you find this time together to be uplifting for you and, and as you begin your week. Uh, our first hymn today is number 510, and we're going to sing all the verses. If you will please stand, we will sing together, Come Ye Disconsolate. <laughs> heads in prayer. God knows <clears throat> us better than we know ourselves. Relying on the Spirit, let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For your whole hurting, hating world, lead us in the ways of peace, especially in places where tyrants reign and people eat the bread of conflict every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For your church, whose body is strong in some places and frail in others, nourish your church in the world, O Lord, that those who are flourishing might proclaim your word with power, and those who are weak might be strengthened to do your work. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For your earth that suffers at the hands of your own people, pour out your healing mercy on this planet you have made and prod us to be worthy stewards of its beauty and its gifts, that in honoring the earth, we may also honor you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who suffer because of disease or injury, the addicted, the abused, the feeble, and the ill, soothe our suffering and heal our wounds, protect us from evil and calm our ancient anxious hearts make us whole in you lord in your mercy hear our prayer for those who are dying and the ones who care for them receive them into your arms of mercy and welcome them into the company of the saints in light lord in your mercy hear our prayer for all those whose burdens we carry in our hearts and those known only to you. Bestow your good gifts as you see fit, supplying every need by the power of your spirit. Accept all these prayers we offer in faith, even as you continue to teach us to pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you're able for the scripture. Today's scripture is Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive give us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Joe. May we bow for a moment. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Lord, teach us to pray, the disciples said to Jesus. But the church for me anyway, as I've been sharing, um, in the church, no one really ever taught me how to pray other than by example. I learned to pray by listening to the prayers of other people and by praying with other people in worship services. But I admit that even after all these years of practicing, to still getting that old familiar feeling welling up in me, that feeling of inadequacy when I'm asked to pray spontaneously. Now I know from my training many classical forms of prayer. But praying for someone isn't just about patterns or the words that we choose. It is a communication. It's a communication with God, and it is a communication between the person praying and all those who may be listening. One of my favorite stories that my dad used to tell was about a fellow pastor that he didn't know very well. He just met him, but one year he happened to be sharing a room with this fellow at their annual conference meeting. Um, and this man's name was Jim, but for some reason, it had stuck in my dad's head that his name was Bob, right? 
So my dad and Jim were sharing this dorm room at Hendricks College, which is a tiny Methodist liberal arts college in central Arkansas that is Scott's alma mater. Now, the dorms at Hendricks were old, and they didn't have private bathrooms like some of them do now. They just had a bathroom for the women and a bathroom for the men on each floor. And so on the first night of annual conference, my dad had to go to the bathroom several times. And so each time he got up and he kind of stumbled out of bed in the dark, you know how you are when you're sleeping in a strange place, and he left the room, went down the hall to take care of business, and then realized that he had not taken the key to his room. So multiple times that night he knocked on the door and he called out, Bob, Bob, I forgot my key. And Jim would stumble out of bed, open the door, and remind him that his name was not Bob. So years go by, years, and they develop a relationship. My dad continues to call him Bob over and over and over again. This strange shared experience bonded the two of them. At some point, Jim became sick. He was um, diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer, and he and his wife went to visit my parents one last time in Fort Smith. And uh, he knew he didn't have much time left on this earth, and so he asked my dad to pray for him and the four of them, my dad, his, my mother, Maisie, J Jim, and his wife all joined hands in a circle, and they bowed their hands, and my father prayed for his dear friend, Bob. When the prayer was finished, my mother looked at my father and said, Louis, his name is Jim, not Bob. And Jim laughed, and he said, It's okay, Maisie. God knows I'm Bob. Whether we have a gift for getting our prayers perfect every time or we make the same mistake over and over, ultimately prayer is not about our words. It's about our hearts. And learning to pray is sort of like learning to ride a bicycle. We learn best not from reading a book or hearing a sermon on prayer, but through the practice of prayer the practice. Furthermore, because prayer is a form of communication, there's, I keep saying this, there's no single way to do it. Each of us has to find our own way to have a little talk with Jesus, to speak with God, however, however we find our own patterns. So this morning, as I mentioned, we are going to have an experiential time together as we learn about some traditional ways of praying, and we're going to actually try some of these things together. That's why you have your Play-Doh, your beads, and if you look inside your bulletin, you should have what's called a finger labyrinth. We're going to start, though, with silence. As we talked about last week, we don't necessarily even need to use words to pray. In Psalm 46, God tells the people who are all busy trying to please God, God says to them, that is enough. Just be still and know that I am God. In other words, sometimes we need to just stop talking and start listening. And this can be a really hard thing to do if we start practicing this kind of prayer because it's so unfamiliar. So let's try it.
Amen. So, folks, that was less than two minutes right there. I would suggest that if you want to try practicing silence as a way of praying at home, that you set a timer for a full five minutes in the beginning. And then just be still and listen, trusting in whatever thoughts come into your mind over those five minutes, whatever comes to you, until the timer chimes. Breath prayer is one of the practices that um, Alan and I learned a little bit about when we were at Holston Annual Conference this year from our uh, Bible study teacher, Tom Albin. Breath players are, are another way of listening for God, of becoming more aware of God's presence. It builds from the idea that the Holy Spirit is as near to us as the air that we breathe all the time. So a very common traditional way to practice breath prayer is by silently repeating a single line prayer with each breath. We're gonna do this out loud this morning, but you could do it silently. And the most common form this takes is something called the Jesus prayer. As you inhale, you address God with the words, Jesus, Son of God. And then as you exhale, you express a request to God with the words, be merciful me, to me, a sinner. Jesus, Son of God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Can you breathe in with me? Jesus, Son of God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, if you don't like that one, there's some others you can try. Creator God, allow me to see the beauty all around me. Holy Spirit, help me to feel your joy. Oh Lord, show me the way, as we sang this morning. Holy One, heal me. You can make up your own. It's basically a word for God and a petition. And you repeat this prayer with each breath in and each breath out for several minutes, maybe going around your prayer beads, holding one at a time with each repetition to mark. And as you're breathing in and out, you're pausing long enough to listen for God as you're praying. Engaging our senses in prayer is another ancient practice in the church. Maybe as Protestants, Protestants we tend to associate these things as more Catholic or Orthodox traditions, and they think maybe these things aren't for us, things with candles and icons and incense, but Christians have been using items to pray, um, beads, crosses, and other objects from the very beginning of the Christian faith. So one thing you might think about doing if you really want to work on this is setting up a kind of place of prayer in your home with a comfortable chair and a small prayer table and maybe a scented candle. Create a prayer ritual in which you light that candle at the beginning, get comfy in your chair, enter into your prayer time, and then mark the end of, of your time of communication with God by extinguishing the candle. That's a very simple pattern you could get into. You can also pray while working a piece of clay in your hands. And if you'd like to try this, there's no pressure, it's up to you, but if you'd like to try, I want you to take out your piece of Play-Doh 
and hold it in your hands. And I know it isn't clay, but I'm, it's going to do for today. And, and gosh, you know, there's nothing more multi-sensory than Play-Doh. Smell it. You smell that familiar scent. It reminds you of when you were a child. It reminds us of school. It reminds us of our parents, a simpler time in life. Holding a malleable substance like clay in our hands, we hold that to remind us ourselves that, that God is constantly shaping us into vessels of the Holy Spirit. We remember the story from Jeremiah, that as Jeremiah was watching a potter shape and reshape the clay on a potter's wheel, that he heard the voice of God saying, like clay in the potter's hands, so are you in mine, shaping and reshaping us throughout our lives. So we're going to sing now a prayer together, and we're going to hold and shape our clay as we consider how God is shaping and molding us. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. Follow Spirit good yeah I've also given you these prayer beads and these are just inexpensive these are christening presents actually so they're really small they only have ten beads and the, a cross and then a central marker and central marker bead you can as I said before you can use these beads with your breath prayer going around and holding each bead as you go through the lines one at a time starting at your big spot in the middle and then going 10 times until you come back around the loop. You could also use these beads to pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, stopping at the end of each praise to listen for God's response. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. You get the idea. You could use beads. You can take them with you if you're going to go walk a labyrinth or go on a prayer walk or pray with scripture, all of which we're going to talk about in a moment. Prayer beads are used in many different traditions, not just Christianity. Um, I don't know. You might find these useful. You might not. Give it a try if you feel compelled. A labyrinth is another tool that can help us focus our prayers. It's a path that's marked out, usually on a, on a floor or in a field or painted someplace, um, that you walk while you pray. There are actually several public-use labyrinths around the Knoxville area. Uh, there's one at, uh, downtown at St. John's Episcopal Church in their garden. Um, there's one at UT Gardens on Nayland. Uh, the Kirklands tell me there's one right over here at Baxter Garden. I don't remember seeing that one, but um, I think there's one at the Unitarian Church on Kingston Pike. Uh, there's a really neat one that was created as an Eagle Scout project at the Episcopal Church of the Ascension on North Shore. It's really cool. You can just Google labyrinths 
Knoxville and find a list of where you can find these. And so while a labyrinth, when you look at it initially, it might look sort of like a maze, that's not what it is. It's a single path. There's not a way in and then a different way out. It's a single path that leads whoever's walking it to the center and then back out. And so as you enter the labyrinth, your prayers are focused here on confession. Each time you come to a place where you must turn and go another direction, that is where you stop and offer a prayer of confession. And when you, if you decide to do this, you, know, you just pray whatever comes into your heart, folks. Whatever God gives you, that's what you get. Don't overthink it. When you get to the center, some people will pause there to read scripture or sing or worship in some other way and then on your way back out of the labyrinth, each time you come to the turn on the way back out, you offer prayers for others, for yourself, for anything else that God brings to your mind. So confession on the way in, praying for others, intercessions and petitions on your way out. Now, since labyrinths are not everywhere, a finger labyrinth, yours is a little bit small, but uh, Michelle tells me it's actually a good ballpoint pen labyrinth because it's a little too big for your finger. Um, um, so you could use this to do the same thing, just stopping when your finger gets here to the first turn, making your first confession and here to the second turn. Or, if you would rather walk, you can pray similarly while strolling around your neighborhood or strolling along a hiking trail, stopping at regular intervals to offer your prayers, perhaps carrying a beads with you to track your pauses and the halfway point. Now, I have to just interject here that I went on a little prayer walk at Angie Green's house a couple of weeks ago. We both did, didn't we, Angie? She's laughing. These beautiful limelight hydrangeas are from Angie's garden this morning, but I gotta tell you, I went out to visit Angie a couple weeks ago, we had a wonderful visit. I, I wanted to see her beautiful gardens. It was a really hot day, hot day. Sun was blazing, but we went around and we looked at all of her beautiful flowers and vegetable gardens and things, <clears throat> and we p cut a bunch of hydrangeas to, for me to bring home, and we're going to try to make them last for church this morning. And so we got done, and we wrapped up all the flowers, and I was getting ready to get in my car, and guess what? I could not find my keys. <laughs> no keys anywhere. So Angie and I begin a prayer walk all back around her house, everywhere we'd been, stopping to pause at each place where we'd had conversations about her flowers. Now, were the keys by the black-eyed Susans? No. Were the keys by the vegetable garden? No. Were they by the strawberry patch? No. Were they by the 20-foot sunflower? No. Were they by the water feature? We're walking, zigzagging, zigzagging, no. Were they by the limelight hydrangeas where we'd bent over to break them off and gather them? No. Four times around, Angie and I prayer walked in the hot sun, and I am sweating profusely. Soon, Angie comes running after me with lemonade. Where were the keys, Angie? <laughs> She's laughing. She said, Dawn, do you think you could have wrapped him up in the bouquet? I said, no, I felt around in the water, they weren't there. So I cut it all open and they dropped out of the middle. <laughs> That's where they were. But it was a prayer walk and God did answer our prayer. Praying with scriptures is a very long tradition in the church. Praying with scriptures involves reading a passage of scripture and intentionally stopping every line or so to pray and to listen to what God brings to your mind. And this is practice can stretch us to bring before God petitions that maybe might, we might not think of on our own. For example, you can pray Mary's 
Magnificat, which is found in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. And if you pray that poem, it can lead you to want to pray for the poor and the oppressed of the world. So we're going to try that together now. I'm going to read a version of the Magnificat that won't be familiar to you because it's from the message translation of the Bible. It's less familiar, but I think it maybe will help us hear the petitions more clearly. I'm going to pause for silence at the end of each phrase, and during that space, I want you to really lean in and listen for what God brings into your mind. Let us pray. I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one good look at me and look what happened. I am the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength, scattering the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. It is exactly what God promised, beginning with Abraham and right up to now. Amen. Now, if you want to try praying with scripture, a really great place to start would be to make a commitment to pray through all the Psalms. Just pray through the Psalms, one each day, taking those pauses to listen at the end of each line. Or pray with scriptures such as stories about Jesus' healings or with his parables. Pray with Paul's letters. All of these things speak deeply to our needs, and they help us to praise, and they remind us of all of the promises of God. Praying with scripture, is a great tool to have in your prayer toolbox. Finally, we can pray by simply checking in with God at the end of the day. Just like you might call a friend or a family member to chat about what's going on in your life, you can have the same conversation with God. I think this is really what my grandmother was after when she taught all of us, her children, our grandchildren, to, to pray on our knees beside her bed at night. Ignatius of Loyola, the 16th century cleric and theologian, taught what, is, what he called the daily examine. The examine asks us to share with God that for which we are thankful. Moments when we've seen and recognized 
God's presence in the events of our day, our shortcomings too, and then to ask God to prepare us for the next day. It's a really simple pattern one that's easy to remember once you get started. It only has four steps to it. Noticing God's presence in the world and being thankful. Offering our confession. Asking us, asking God to help us be prepared for tomorrow. Just as there are many ways to communicate with the people that we love, there are many ways to communicate with God in prayer. So as I close, I want to invite each of us to try to be a little bit more intentional about this. Scott and I are talking about ways we're going to do this in our own home to develop a more robust, richer prayer life by truly seeking what works for each one of us as individuals and in doing so, asking with the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. Amen. Thank you for coming out to pray with us today here at St. Paul, whether you're here in our sanctuary or with us online. I would remind you that uh, this ministry is supported by people's gifts and offerings. And while we do not pass the offering plate here at St. Paul anymore, it is at the back of our sanctuary for you to give as you come or leave. But there are other ways to give at St. Paul. You can set up through our um, Engage system an automatic on, online prayer each week. You can go online at our website and follow the links to online giving, or you can send us a check and send it to the address on your screen, 4014 Garden Drive, Knoxville, Tennessee. As we prepare to uh, sing our closing prayer, will you stand and turn to number 522? We're going to sing together. Lead.
and we're going to sing verses take our burdens to the Lord and leave them there and let God bring healing to our lives. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>